I'm Silver Quill, the Brony Alice from Denver, and you're listening to the MBS Show. To the MBS show, episode 106. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is James Cork. Hey, Norman. Hello, James. How are you? I'm fine. So, how was your birthday, man? Oh, my birthday was fine. Yeah, by the way, we're recording this on the 15th of March, a day after my birthday. It was a very good celebration. Yay, birthday's awesome. You get cake and you get presents. Yay. And yesterday, especially, I got pie because it was pie day. <laughs> oh, yes. 3, 14, 15. That's pie. Uh, how the hell do I remember that? Uh, but anyway, our guest for this week is a really awesome brony analyst. Did I say that right? Brony analysis. An- analyst. Brony analyst. Yeah, okay. Brony analyst. Silver Quill. Greetings, bronies of the internet. I mean you no harm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> run away! Run away! <laughs> <laughs> you run away. I'm going to. I'm going to be here with a banner saying, "No, we love you." <laughs> How are you, Silva? I'm doing well. How about you guys? I'm clearly confused at what I'm doing right now. I definitely can't complain. It's wonderful to have you on the show here with us, and uh, we thank you for taking this time of your day to give us the chance to interview you and ask you these many questions and put you under the microscope, the kind of the same way you put so many episodes under the microscope. <laughs> That's right. The entire series is one amoeba tray for me to study. <laughs> I really like your videos. And you know what? If I keep continuing talking about the videos, we're going to go to guest time. So we, we have a lot before that. And the important thing is we have four important questions for you before we start the show. And question number one is, who is your favorite character? That would be Fluttershy. Yes! <laughs> I am outnumbered today. <laughs> <laughs> the Fluttershy conglomerate will destroy you. If that's okay with you. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Uh, okay, why Fluttershy? Because that's an interesting one. I, well, much like Fluttershy, I was very shy growing up, uh, very quiet and a little reserved, so I saw a lot of myself in her. Mm, okay. To be honest, you're one of the few popular bronies out there, and how does that make you feel? <laughs> uh, startled, to be honest. Uh, when I started this up, I didn't really anticipate becoming more well-known and uh, or even doing weekly episode reviews. The first was just going to be little opinion pieces. Mm, I see that because your first video, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is Get Hyped the Princess Debate. So was that the first or was there something else before that? Oh, you're exactly right. That was the very first video I ever did. Mm, okay. So opinion pieces like that and, well, it blew up. Like you are currently trying to review all of season four. Yeah, the key word there is trying. I'm a little slower than other reviewers. Oh, it's okay, it's okay. You know, what you do is you take your time to do your videos. The longer you take to do them, the better they're going to be. Like, you release the video, like, a week after the episode has been premiered, but uh, when when, uh, when has that ever been a bad thing? It usually is kind of better. You let the episode settle down and shimmer on you, and then you can give a much more thoughtful and calm analysis of it. That's certainly my hope. What I'm trying to say, in short, is that the wait is definitely worth it. Indeed, indeed. So anyway, moving on to the next question. What's your favorite episode? Surprisingly, it was Sweet and Elite. Ooh. Which is funny, because neither Rarity nor Sweetie Belle are, like, my favorite characters, though I'm very fond of them. That makes me so happy, because that is also one of my favorite episodes. <laughs> definitely a number one spot. I like it because of... The witchcrafting, <laughs> they change it to something really awesome. What did you like of uh, Sweet and Elite? What makes you say it's your favorite episode, despite not being a Fluttershy-focused episode? Well, it, it's funny because I can't point to one thing and say this is the moment where it became my favorite. It's not like uh, Sonic Rain Boom, which had like this great climax scene. Mm, it's like they hit yeah. every note just right, I felt. Sympathetic towards Sweetie Belle, I, I identified with Rarity, really celebrated Applejack be, serving as sort of a mentor figure, and oh. Apple Bloom with her one day uh, just being very funny. So the oh, whole thing, okay. everything just came together perfectly. I just realized you're confusing episodes. That wasn't Sweet and Lead, that was Sister Wait, that of was Social. Sister of Social. Oh, so yes. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So it's an elite is the episode where uh, Rarity goes to Manhattan. She became, she becomes friends with uh, Fancy Pants, and then the main six arrive, and they kind of it's Twilight's birthday, 
So, yeah. yeah, but but yeah, the one that you're talking about is uh, Sisterhood Social, which is also a really good episode. You, you know what, James? I, I got confused, too. It's my favorite episode that is not Sweet Millie. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, it is Sisterhood Social. I got mixed up completely there. Redacted. <laughs> it, it, it's a derpy day. Everyone's just derpy. So yes. it's forgivable. <laughs> You know um, what? It, you you cannot be blamed because uh, that episode, uh, those two episodes have barely any episodes in between. Like they are both reality centric, and they came out almost at the same time. And there were no other reality episodes up until Reality Takes Manhattan this year. So it's completely comprehensible that you can get those two mixed up. Co-reviewer Film Spark said it's been two years since we had yeah. a reality centric episode. Literally two years. I think the last one was November 2011. <laughs> wow, James. What a strong memory. <laughs> uh, reality is my favorite. I make a point of... Uh, of re- and also I make a point of remembering all, all the episodes. <laughs> it, it, I, I cannot help it. It kind of goes with, my, with how, I was, how I was raised. <laughs> okay. But anyway, moving on to the third question. How did you become a fan of the show? Well, mostly through word of mouth. Uh... I joined just as season two and started up, but I watched it from the opening episodes all the way through season one first. Mm. And uh, I just heard about it on word of mouth. I can remember the first time I ever truly heard about it was on the web series Red vs. Blue. They do comics over there, and uh, one of the crew was asking, hey, where's Jeff? And they said, oh, he's seen someone about a horse. <laughs> Next thing you know, one of the characters is riding on the back of Rainbow Dash over a rainbow. <laughs> okay. And I thought to myself, wait, My Little Pony? Isn't that the show I didn't watch in the 80s because Transformers was on? <laughs> That's a good excuse. That's a good excuse. That's the best excuse, yeah. Uh, and then I, uh, it just, I kept hearing about it until I said, you know what? I'm curious. Let's take a look. Oh, that's the gateway drug. That's right. And you were like, one more episode. Okay, one more episode. Okay, one more. One okay, more. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I just finished the entire first season. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the second one? Oh, there, it's coming. When? <laughs> October. Why? <laughs> so you started off with the first episode or some random episodes? With the first episode. I started with Friendship is Magic and uh, just went in order. What do you think of the first two episodes? Like, were you at the start thinking, okay, I'm just going to give this a shot. If it sucks, well, I wasn't expecting that much. Were you surprised of the two-parter and were you surprised with how it went? Well, I won't say that, you know, lightning struck and I became a brony on the first viewing. I thought, that was pretty good. I mean, I can see why it's getting, uh, being celebrated online. But it wasn't really until we got into sort of the slice of life mini adventures Mm. that it really started to get into it. The Friendship is Magic premiere, I gotta gotta agree with the critics who say they gave away most of the plot right when Twilight is in the library describing the elements. The subtlety is not strong with this episode. (laughs) The foreshadowing is so much, it overshadows the entire episode. Oh, well, it's it's a start. And it is a fun start, and that's the the key. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the last question is, what do your family and friends think about your love for the show? Well, my friends, most of them are not really bronies and sort of insist on not watching it. They're insane, of course. My friends are insane. Obviously, (laughs) obviously. (laughs) But, you know, I don't try to cram it in their faces. They don't make a big deal out of it. So it's just sort of a mutual, hey, that's what you like, cool. And they do watch my videos and enjoy at least the jokes that aren't uh, that may not relate entirely to the show. Uh. My animator's too lazy for a flight animation. <laughs> <laughs> that is my favorite joke of all the ones that you've made. <laughs> oh, we, we need to ask about your um, where do you get your inspiration for your comedy? But we'll do that later because I do enjoy your jokes. Uh, that attitude that you have towards uh, your friends and family, that is probably the best attitude that you can have. Because it does become really awkward when the only thing you can talk about is that one thing that you are a fan of. Whether it is ponies, Pokemon, Star Wars, Mass Effect, or Pixar movies. It's like, if you don't have any other conversation subject, you are going to end up getting people tired really fast, really soon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I totally agree. I... Uh... You know, my friends are big fan, are big fans of Japanese superheroes, and so that's something we commute over, and that's where again I got some ideas for uh, my uh, Power Ponies review. 
I was about to say, did you get the reviewer chains? <laughs> Silver Will is a Super Sentai. So you're a Sentai fan too? Yes, I've, uh, my, my friend got me hooked up until uh, he introduced me. I'd only known Power Rangers here in America. Uh, watching Super Sentai is, it's almost a completely different mindset. Oh, yeah. What's funny is that that review of PowerPoint has actually got featured on a TV Nihon blog, I believe. <laughs> wow. Okay. okay. What did they say? They actually say, if you like uh, ponies, watch this reviewer transform into a Sentai. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. As a, as a huge fan of Power Rangers, I completely commune with your episode review. It's, it's the, I think it's my favorite next to, uh, next to the one of, of, of Bats. Oh, I'm glad you like the bats one. I got a lot of comments from people. I couldn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> Come on, you you were you were Hunter S. Thompson in Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. If you cannot understand one of Johnny Depp's best acting performances in his life, you definitely need help. But you, you know what? I think that's going border to um, guest time. There's a lot of things I want to ask, but you know what? We let's move on so we can get to that section. Anyway, thank you, Silver, for answering the four important questions. You bet. Now we can move on. Yay! All right. Moving on to the next topic is housekeeping. Just like last year, we have an award for you guys to vote for. Pick the best out of the best and vote for your favorite personalities. Links can be found in the show notes. So, guys, go vote. Pick your favorite and make sure that favorite wins. Yay! But it's fine because everyone is a winner when they are get chosen. Indeedy. So anyway, moving on to the next topic is news time. In today's news time, My Little Pony CCG comprehensive rules are available. For anyone that is playing the My Little Pony CCG, we have a few updates for you. Enterplay has released a comprehensive rule document for the My Little Pony CCG game. Collectible car game. Collectible car game. Indeed. Uh, these rules are more detailed and serve as the last word on any rule issue. Links can be found in the show notes. I do not believe this. My Little Pony CCG has become Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon. <laughs> oh. No, no. no you, what is with this, the, 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 the new collectible card games that are, they have to be so needlessly complicated. Back, I'm going to sound like an old man right now, but back in my day, <laughs> would you used to just put the land, the land cards on the table, then you use your spells and you defeat the other magician. That's it. That, that, that was it. Magic the Gathering is super simple, but then you have all these other rules that you can either apply or not. And anyone can, can understand them, and anyone can comprehend them. From what I saw of the MLP collectible card game, it's ridiculously complex. But it's a complex that is really fun, to be honest. I, I've played it, and it's pretty interesting. Silver, have you played this? I've not played uh, the My Little Pony game. I, I just uh, said farewell to my Yu-Gi-Oh card collection. Oh, it's, it's oh no, what happened? I was in purge mode for my home, which uh, mm. means if I haven't really invested in something in a while, it's probably time to clear some space uh, so I can collect oh. ponies. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. You so, know what? That is a really good philosophy. Well, it's it's always hard. My my Gundam models, my Zoid models. Oh, oh no! Oh, <laughs> but uh, you you are right that card games can get very complicated. But at the same time, I'm always amazed in Yu-Gi-Oh, as I probably <laughs> will be with My Little Pony, that people pull off these combinations you never think of. I mean, they must have like an encyclopedic knowledge uh, just to be able to come up with these combinations. Oh, that, that is true. Yeah, from what I remember playing Yu-Gi-Oh, it's all math, and it's all about, aha, I'm going to attack you with this monster, haha, you, you activated my trap card, oh no, because your trap card activated my other trap card. It's kind of like the poker of collectible card games, it's kind of like, aha, this, I'm going to defeat you with, oh no, well, too much, to, sorry. To, to be honest, um, I, I think I may be the only insane one here, because... I built a deck called the Final Countdown deck where... No, you know what? That's another discussion for another day. Yes. This is not your, your podcast. This is the MBS show. <laughs> yeah. But on a final note, that deck was insane. I didn't have to do anything. Just wait 20 turns and I win. <laughs> uh, but anywho, let's move on to the next news. And in the next news, Record Legend coming this year. We hope. 
Do you enjoy playing Rayman games? Do you want ponies in your Rayman games? Well, we have the perfect game for you! Introducing Raycott Legends! Raycott Legend is a platform inspired by Rayman Legends and My Little Pony. Made by fans using Unity 3D game engine, After Effects, Photoshop, Paint to Sigh, and a ridiculous amount of caffeine. It is slated to come out this year. Links can be found in the show notes. So guys, have you seen the video for this? Because this is really amazing. Uh, I've not seen it yet, but I, I'm not surprised that Pony goes with anything. Oh, true indeed. Just click the Tumblr uh, blog because it is really good. If you played Rayman before, like the newer version of Rayman, it is almost to that degree of awesomeness. God, I can't wait. I hope Hasbro ignores this. A repeat of finding is magic. Yeah, yeah. ignore. Don't, don't look at us. We're, not, we're nothing. You know, I'm not really a fan of the Rayman games because I, I have played a couple, but not extensively. But out of all the characters that you could put in the place of Rayman, they chose Discord. Yes. It, which is, I don't know, maybe it's explaining the story or something, but... Out of all the characters that this show has to offer, Discord is kind of like a weird pick, isn't it? It's true, but have you seen the design? Because, okay, just imagine this. Discord body in the design of Rayman. So no limbs, just the hand and legs. <laughs> yeah, hand and legs and all that. Yeah, I, I am actually watching the trailer right now. And I'm thinking, uh, it, it could have been also a good idea to put Spike in the role. Because, you know, hands and all that. I'm pretty sure they chose Discord because of the hands. <laughs> because he has hands. Yeah, but, but it's really fun. I, I can't wait to play it. I, I hope it comes out. Less buggy and stuff. But, um, Silver, what do you think? Like, what's your expectation? Are you hyped to play this or not? Well, I'm always up for a good game. Uh, I gotta be honest that the Rayman series passed me by. I, I forget what I was playing. I just got in the PlayStation when Rayman was at its height, so... Metal Gear Solid demanded a lot of my time. <laughs> oh, I understand. Very good game. In my best Solid Snake, you're playing Raymond. What's Raymond? <laughs> <laughs> it's Raymond, Snake. It's not Raymond. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> yeah, can you imagine Psycho Mantis reading your mind? So, you like to play Raymond, don't you? And you like ponies. What's wrong with you? Wait, what? <laughs> you don't like ponies? You truly are a Psycho Mantis. <laughs> <laughs> but still, but still, I, I wish them good luck because uh, this is one of those games that can prove that the fandom can do almost anything. <laughs> and on to the next news. Kid being bullied because of Rainbow Dash backpack and school tells Kid to keep it at home. Grayson Bruce, a nine-year-old boy from North Carolina, was bullied at school because of his Rainbow Dash backpack. To resolve the problem, school officials sent a letter to Grayson telling him not to bring the backpack because it triggers for bully. Links can be found in the show notes. And gentlemen, I have to say that this is one insane news. First we got Michael and then we got Grayson now. What's the world coming to? Well, this is the, this is the nature of bullies because bullying didn't start with bronies. It's just that it's unexpected, so it makes an easy target. These school people are idiots. They think that, if oh, if you just don't bring a backpack, the bullies won't bother you. No. The pony thing is just a target. If they don't find, if they lose that target, then the bullies will just find something else to try and make people miserable. To be honest, um, I for one here understand why the school official did so because it's a situation where, okay, kid is being bullied for this. This is the trigger. Um, stop the trigger, stop the trigger. Yeah, but you know, that's kind of a, that's kind of unnecessary because now the kid is only not going to be able to bring his Rainbow Dash backpack, but now the kids in school are going to bully him for being a brownie and for not being able to bring his backpack to school. So... It's like now the now the school has given the bullies even more ammunition to use against this poor kid. I can understand what the school is going for because they think that uh, removing the backpack from the equation is going to stop the bullying. But the bullying doesn't come from the backpack. The bullying doesn't come from the victim. It's never the victim's fault mm. when they get attacked. It's the fault of the person who attacks them. Yeah, so they, they should they they should. Instead of telling the kid not to bring the backpack, they should send those bullies home. They should, like, suspend them or tell something to their parents and leave that other kid alone. Yeah, but in this kind of situation, it's really hard to do so because 
bullies are everywhere. That's the thing. Bullies are everywhere. If the kid doesn't really report, like Grayson here, he, if he doesn't report it to the school official, the school official can't do much. Now, if he did report it, it's one of those situations where the school needs to investigate it first before they need to take any actions. So it's really hard for everyone in this situation, except for the bullies. The bullies can go to hell. The bullies have to live their lives making other people feel miserable and feel good about themselves. They're not getting off easy either. That is true. That is true. Because like in any stereotype show, when you see the bully at home, he's abused, he has a really sucky life. It, it could be that, I don't know, I'm just stating what I see in TV. But the thing is, it's not right to bully. Who, no, just no. Yeah, you know, what? I wish I wish these kids that are getting bullied could, uh, could be hearing us at the moment. Because what they have to know is that this doesn't last forever. You are not going to... You're not going to get bullied all your life. It stops. Eventually, it ends. There is one point in your life where the bullying just downright stops. And you just have to, you just have to stay strong. You have to surround yourself with people that care for you, that share your interests, and that can respect you. And thankfully, you have an entire fandom that has your back. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're going to be there to support you. And they have to remember that this is just a phase. It it stops eventually. Oh, it yeah. doesn't last forever. It is difficult because when you're in that situation and you are suffering that, it does feel like it's going to last forever because you're suffering so much that the days feel like months. So it's it's all a matter of staying strong. And it is difficult. I know it is difficult. I've been bullied when I was in, in high school. In, yeah, in, and, in middle school. Yeah, it's like bullying is always prevalent and it's always there. But if you have people that care for you and that are there to defend you, it's, it's much easier to uh, to endure it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as for me, I've been bullied throughout my school life. So, yeah, no me- good memories of school. Like, if you talk to other people, they have really good memories of school. As for me, I don't. <laughs> Shows you how I experience school. But honestly speaking, Grayson, if you're listening to this, be strong. Just ignore them. Just, you know, do your own thing. Because you like what you like. If it's about shows about ponies, or is it shows about anime girls transforming into awesome superheroes, it doesn't really matter. It's your interest. It's not theirs. Your interests don't determine the type of person that uh, that you are. You determine the type of person that you are. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But anyway, with that out of the way, let's move on to the next topic. And the next topic is guest time. In today's guest time, like I said, we have a really awesome brony analyst who is not a pony. Shocker there. Hello, Silver. How are you? I'm well. I'm only half pony. Yay! <laughs> Which part? The headquarters, if I recall. <laughs> hey uh, But anyway, uh, Silver, how are you? How are you? Well, a little derpy, otherwise good. Okay. Having fun yet? Oh, yeah. very much. Yay! I'm doing something right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Silver, mind introducing yourself to the people who might not know who you are and what you do? Well, I am the brony known as Silver Quill. Uh, started out with this fandom just drawing comics and was uh, lucky enough to be featured on Equestria Daily a few times. And then uh, just before Season 4 started up, I produced videos on YouTube, which has grown into uh, a weekly review of each episode, trying to keep up with the season. I am probably the only fan who wishes that the episodes would take a weekend off so I could (laughs) catch up. (laughs) You don't have to worry about that because, like I said before, the longer you take making an episode review, the better it's going to be. And so far, that's been the rule. It's like... Uh, you have been improving from the very first videos that you have done. They ca- they kept getting better. It's like there is it's, there is an ascending curve in the quality of your videos. More animation, except for the flying, which p- you're you're never gonna fly in your, in those videos, aren't you? <laughs> well, I've set a goal on a, a Patreon page. If I get uh, if I get a certain donation level, I'll I'll get a flight animation. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, Talk about p- 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 we we complain about Scootal or not being able to fly. I think she's going to fly before you. <laughs> <laughs> and I can do an animation of me hopping after. Get back down here. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Silver, people are, might be confused about your character. At first, it might look like a different, but when they see the full detail, it has a pony hindquarter. So, mind telling us or mind telling the people who are less educated. What are you? I am a freak of nature. No. <laughs> oh, you mean my character? Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, let's see. Hippogriffs are an actual mythological creature, an actual mythological creature. That sounds like a contradiction. <laughs> but uh, they are a part of mythology. They've been featured in epic poems, and even in modern culture, you've got Harry Potter, World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. When I decided I wanted to produce a video, I, I looked at the current review staff, or fandom, uh, you know, uh, Paleo Steno, Digi Brony, Tommy Oliver, ANY, all those good folks. And they all had pony personas. And I thought, one, there's a lot of people doing this already. It's going to be hard to really stand out. And two, do I want to do a pony as well? That feels like it's sort of saturated right now. So I thought about it. I thought about a griffin, went a little okay, but, the, you know, the only griffins at the time were Gilda and Gustav neither of which very appealing. Uh, And now we've got background griffins, which haven't done anything. But I flipped through a book I have, The Wizard's Bestiary, and found the uh, entry on hippogriffs, and found out they are the offspring of a horse or pony and a griffin, Mm. which is kind of funny because in mythology they are mortal enemies. So a a hippogriff is a symbol of love. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like the, the, the result of uh, Romeo and Juliet version on mythology <laughs> like Romeo being a, a griffon and and Juliet being a horse <laughs> that's right and hopefully they're a little bit smarter about things and I thought okay this could work I could still have a, a cutie mark identify myself as a fan but not a fan that you might necessarily expect the same things or I might wing off from what the fandom normally perceives so it seemed like a good statement, and I ran with it. And I have to say, it's a really good pick because, well, uh, there's not much hippogriff. I, I, for me, I think you're the only hippogriff I know of. As for griffins, well, we got the amazing black griffin, and we got Jackalap. Um, Jackalap was, is that how you call his name, that artist? Yeah, movie? Jackalap. Yeah, Jackalap is, uh, a griffin. Jackalap is another, another musician, and yes, he yeah. is a griffin. Yeah, so I mean, we, we got those people, and hippogriff... Uh, I think you're the only one that I know of. Which has surprised me. I, I thought, oh, if I'm thinking about this, odds are at least a uh, hundred other people in the fandom have as well. So I think I kind of lucked out on that score. Yeah, I, I think everybody else is going for wings and horns <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny how there is an excess of like, uh, people like to put I- unicorns or like alicorns uh, way before trying to find uh, something completely original. Um how many designs do you have to go through when you decided to uh, stick with the one that you have right now? Like the one you said, this is the one. This is the one I want to go. Well, I went through several designs, had a sketchbook and just sort of scribbled in it, uh, trying to do various poses and designs until uh, until I, th- I came upon what I currently use. I did use uh, Big Macintosh and Gilda as references just to sort of I try to capture the look of the show as much as I can, with the, <laughs> which is kind of hard given that there are no hippogriffs in the show. Oh, that's true. Mm-hmm. I think one of the best choices I made was to uh, put the feathers on the back of the character's head, which can make it more expressive. Oh, uh, have, yes. Have a drooper stand up. Uh, I also posted early vector drawings on DeviantArt and asked people for feedback and just sort of updated the same image as we went along. And it was a huge help. People gave me some great feedback on color balance, the number of feathers, where their eyes fell uh, on first look. How many different facial expressions are now in your list of vectors? Because in one of your reviews, you go through a lot of facial expressions. So uh, how many do you have available right now? I'm going to say at least 25. That's quite a lot. I can very quickly just shuffle through my uh, files and just try to... The computer does the counter f- counting for me, which is so very kind of it. <laughs> but I've been a fan of review videos for a while, and one of the complaints I see on forums is, oh, the characters just stand in the corner not really moving, mm-hmm. which, fair enough. I think the focus should still be on the video, but you want to keep a little bit of dynamic visuals for my stand-in as well. Mm. So let's see here. Oh, I oh I take it back. I'm way short. Just for when I'm uh, when my character's facing you head-on, that's 30 expressions and counting. Oh, wow. For um, my usual three-quarter turn, that's 54 items. Wow. wow. 
I haven't counted these in a while, and 15 items for when he's sitting. Wow. Huh. Sometimes these are just like one-shot views, like uh, my Batman. Yeah. <laughs> you end up losing count of how many times... Uh, you have drawn your character or how many drawings you have done because you are you are not thinking, okay, I'm going to draw this many. You are thinking, okay, I need this kind of face, this kind of face, this kind of face, and then you draw all of them and you lose count of how many uh, how many you end up drawing in the end. Exactly right. It's it's more about just getting swept up in the process. And then I look at it and I'm just like, whoa, dang. So that's where my afternoon went. <laughs> you are like, why do I have 20 gigabytes worth of vectors in my computer? Oh, that's why. Huh. What program do you use to draw? Uh, Adobe Illustrator for the most part. And then I mm. prep all the files in Photoshop. Ooh. Ah, okay. You're, a, you're an Adobe guy. You're like me. <laughs> and like me, I use Illustrator. <laughs> Illustrator is awesome for vectors. Really easy to use. So when it, when, it comes to, when it comes to drawing, do you use a tablet or a mouse? Uh, I am hooked on a tablet. In fact, I just got a new Wacom recently. So uh, I, I couldn't do this with a mouse, especially oh, yeah. I, I work on a, on a MacBook Pro, mm. which oh, if oh. you don't have a mouse, that trackpad <laughs> will not serve you for drawing. Oh, yeah. It's not user-friendly. My sister has a MacBook Pro as well, and yeah, for drawing, the the touchpad is not a good tool. Yep. But um, having a tablet works both ways, really, even if for vectoring, because doing the things that you need to do in Illustrator is no fun. You'll get cramps and you'll get couple tunnel. Is that how you say it? Yeah, but anyway... So you use Illustrator and Photoshop for the arts. So what do you use for the video process or the video editing? About six years ago, I invested in getting a Final Cut Pro 6. They're up to Final Cut Pro 10 now, which has been called the death of computer editing. <laughs> they apparently shot themselves in the foot on that one. But Final Cut Pro 6 is still very solid, very reliable, and very powerful as an editing tool. And while I only just started doing pony videos, I've actually worked as a professional video editor for five years. Ah, okay. Uh, and also, after I changed professions, I still help a friend edit together Japanese uh, superhero panels for a local anime convention. Well, that's interesting. So this editing, it does come natural to you because you've been doing it for so long. And I've watched a lot of TV, which never hurts when you're actually working on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for the animation that you do, is it Flash or is it just Final Cut, right? It is in Final Cut. I, I have not yet learned Flash or perhaps Adobe After Effects would be good as well. My animations are admittedly very, very basic. I'm sure there are brony animators out there who are looking at my stuff and going, ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, to, to be honest, for a review show like yours, it's rather entertaining. I do like the setup. I do like the whole process that you do just to tell what you think about the show. Unlike other reviewers out there, you take more steps into doing your videos. Yeah, within the context of how you're reviewing and, and the, the tone that you're going for, it definitely fits. It goes so well together. It's like bread and butter. Well, it's very much of it is inspired by um, reviewers like the Nostalgia Critic, Angry Joe, <laughs> the Spoony One, and uh, and Linkara, <laughs> and all the other folks on that guy with the glasses. So many to to name. <laughs> you just mentioned four of my favorite uh, internet critics at this moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to ask you, um, where did you get your inspiration for your comedic timing? And, well, you just answered it, because I noticed a few jokes in your video where I could point out that, hey, that's something from Linkara, uh, that's something from The Nerd, or something from The Nostalgia Critic. So, I, I guess we, it's safe to say that everyone in this call are a big fan of that guy with the glasses. <laughs> I think that's a safe bet. Yep, yep. Uh, that is a safe bet indeed. I also get a lot of inspiration from Mystery Science Theater 3000, which uh, oh, yeah. I watched so much growing up. And you can ask my friends, I'm horrible to watch a movie with at home because I will supply <laughs> running commentary. You will riff on it. Oh, does that mean you, you, you are also familiar with riff tracks? Oh, yes. I, I've enjoyed riff tracks and I've even gotten to. Uh, we have a theater where I live that shows some of their uh, monthly Riff Tracks live broadcasts. Oh, so I oh my god. Oh my god, that is awesome. Oh, it's fun. Last one I think I saw was Night of the Living Dead. 
Rift Tracks edition. <laughs> oh, that, that is so awesome! Oh my so, god, have you watched? Have you watched the Rift Tracks for the happening? You know, I haven't even seen the happening yet. <laughs> oh my more god! Enjoyable with the Rift Tracks. <laughs> Oh my god, look, look. Okay, you have to make a point. The Happening is already a really hilarious movie, but with the riff tracks on, it's one of the best comedies of all time. It's unbelievably funny. Um, I'll have to remember that. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely remember that. Um, uh, when when it comes to uh, the writing and uh, what you write for your review and what you say on, on it, are you usually open for improvisation or do you script everything and make sure that everything is well tied and it's all scripted? I am a fan of improvisation, but for recording my audio, normally everything's scripted out in advance. I've taken a day or a day and a half to just sort of process the episode, figure out what I really liked, what I thought could have been improved, and also just sort of look at, what well, that was odd. What, can I poke a joke at that? And for that, I really do need to have it scripted so I can know what to draw, what tone to take. Sometimes during recording, I'll say, you know, this might be funnier if I said this, or this joke might come across wrong if I say it this way. How about this way? But by and large, the overall structure is scripted. That's usually better. Less of a hassle for you. Improvisation can be fun, but it's definitely going to end up giving you a lot more work. Oh, that's just true. Like this show, we improvise everything. <laughs> so, Silva... I do notice that you have a few um, crossovers with some other people. So how does that work? Do you call them or do you just barge in and say, I want to do this with you now? Well, no one's barged in, but uh, I am amazed at how often people want to do a collaboration, which is, again, sort of startling of how quickly this has taken off. Um, after I did about my third video, I was invited to join a, a Skype group of Brony Analysis. And I've just gotten to know people through there, and that's been the primary contact. Film Sparks, the first collab I ever did, he is not a part of that group. He contacted me uh, through Skype and asked, and he showed me a link to uh, not necessarily a review, but he was just sort of doing a, a podcast with his friend talking about it. And it's really fun. Going back to high school for a minute, who here had to do group projects, and which were usually just one guy coasts and the other guy does all the work? <laughs> I did that in college. Everyone. Yeah, that's college too. This has been wonderful because it's the first time I really felt like a group project was a group project. That everyone was contributing, everyone was bringing their own thoughts to the table and working their own ideas. I do a lot of the graphics because it's my video, but you know, the Film Sparks, Toon Critic, Commander Firebrand, and my next review will co-star Eliora. Ooh. They've all put forth great effort and comedy and creativity in writing the scripts. And I've got a couple more collabs lined up before the season's done, so I'm going to be tired. <laughs> Yay! Well, well, the season's going to end soon. We're on episode, what, um, 17, James? Or is it 18? Uh, 17. Yeah. You only have nine more episodes before the season ends. Yeah. <laughs> It's gone by quick. It is going back super quick. Do you remember that at this point people were struggling because, oh my god, that drought <laughs> was like going through a desert waiting for season four to start and now it's about to end. And, oh my god, how did it go so fast? The last season was only half the length. It was only 13 episodes and, oh well, they had to, well, you know, compensate one for another. <laughs> In my opinion, they could have made it longer, but eh, that's a, that's a discussion for another time. Mm hmm. When it comes to reviewing or analyzing something, when do you think it's enough of analyzing or reviewing? When's the point where you say, okay, I am reading way too much over the, on this, I need to stop, or like I'm losing the point, or like this has nothing to do with what I was starting uh, talking about? It can be a hard judgment call. One of the big criticisms I hear of critics or reviewers is that people say you're overthinking it, and I've never supported that line of thought, because how is there a boundary line between thinking and overthinking, you know, that's really just a fly swatter statement to get people to stop. And oftentimes used by people who don't like reviews at all. For me, I think it's the question of how much significance are you assigning to one act? Example from back in season two, Baby Cakes, where Twilight is saying to Pink, you know, being a babysitter is a lot of responsibility. And, she, and I thought when I first watched that, I thought, wow, she's coming off as kind of haughty here. You know, we're kind of disrespecting her friend. And that was only part of an episode. It's worth noting, but it's not the whole episode. And so I say to myself when I'm reviewing this, okay, 
how much did this really impact me and how much does it stack up against the rest of the episode? Because sometimes I can forgive a little minor thing in favor of a more entertaining overall package. And sometimes that's part of why I like to take a day just to process everything. Because how we react right away may not be our lasting impression. You know, I completely agree with you because I do reviews on my side as well, but I don't have the programs to or, or the technology to do video reviews. So what I do is written ones. Back in season two, I did a review of Putting Your Hoof Down, and I very much gave it a very positive view of it. But then after several viewings, I realized I found the episode not as enjoyable And at one point, I actually was unable to finish watching it because my problems with putting your hope down are completely personal. I'm not regarding it as a bad episode, but it's like if I had to write a review of that episode now, it would be completely different from what I wrote back then. So I completely understand where you're coming from there. So you will say that one of the things that make the your reviews come out so uh, so late, so to speak, is that you take time to let them sit down and let them give a lasting impression on you? Yeah, I, I've always sort of been a reflective personality type, and I find that the knee-jerk reaction is probably not my, my greatest strength. That is very mature, and that is a really good philosophy that... Mm. Uh, many people should should apply and follow, and mm. that's that's wonderful. I guess we will never expect you to try to make a parallelism between Kafka and Nietzsche and My Little Pony, right? I'm not making any promises. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I'm saying, because there was um, not one of the other brownie analysts, like uh, Digi Brownie or Brownie Curious. They are really good on what they do because they keep themselves focused. But there was one guy who didn't have an OC, no nothing. He was talking directly to the camera. And he started to quote Kafka and Nietzsche. I'm not, I'm not joking. To explain why the narrative of Derin Don't was such a mess. What? <laughs> yeah, I'm not joking. He started saying that, and, and I'm like, I cannot believe this. I, I think he, he cannot stop doing videos. I don't even remember his name, but I swear to God, I was like, this is horrible. How can someone make something like It didn't make any sense. I watched the video like three times, and I was like, this makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Why is he talking about Kafka? It's kind of funny. It sounds like he was going very high concept. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, at least once per video, I will get someone commenting, why are you reviewing a little kid's show? <laughs> okay. The, the first counter response is, of course, why are you clicking on a review video for a little kid's show? <laughs> but I actually just yesterday got my hands on a Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth. Uh, oh, great I've book. never seen the whole thing. But the thing about storytelling is that no matter what the age group, the fundamentals still apply. So I kind of get where this fellow was coming from, quoting famous philosophers to try and make it relatable. It does apply. But at the same time, I guess if you go too high concept, you might lose a lot of people. You know, I, I yeah, I completely agree with you because it doesn't matter who you are quoting as long as you keep it focused. But he definitely lost the point. Literally, at one point, it started to become a lecture in philosophy rather than a, a review of an episode. And I think you can work with that. I think if you're big on philosophy, you could use an episode to illustrate a point. Yeah. Like, it's about time. Anthony C., came one of my favorite reviewers, when he pointed out that there are three perspectives at play. You've got Twilight worrying too much about the future, mm -hmm. Spike not worrying about the future at all, <laughs> and also suffering for it, and then, which completely I missed watching the episode, Pinky, who prepares but doesn't worry. Ah, she's living the moment. She lives in the moment, and she has balloon-related emergencies <laughs> all prepared. Yeah, and there are three, of course, it's, yeah, she has eye patches all over Ponyville. <laughs> But yeah, you're absolutely right. I completely didn't notice uh, Pinky's point of view. Mm. Wow. And that's the fun in reviews, that you get a perspective you might not otherwise have noticed. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's to watch these analysis videos. Because whether you agree with the reviewer or not, you are having a completely new perspective. So it's like, if you're mature and grown up and you are strong will enough, your opinion is not going to change. If anything, you're going to become with a bigger knowledge mm. of what the episode is about by watching someone else's perspective. And, well, for example, as for me, when 
we were discussing about simple ways. Like I told you, I didn't really enjoy the episode that much until you told me about certain things, which kind of opened my eyes and look at the episode at certain views, which was really interesting. I do like that, where someone can change my opinion of the episode. I I will say uh, right away that I am disgustingly positive when it comes to this TV show, and it takes a lot to make me... Uh, to make me ac- acknowledge some of the biggest flaws. Like, for me, that it's really hard to come up with a, with a deal. Actually, that is a good question. Uh, what would you consider a deal breaker for you that uh, makes you say, oh, this episode, it's not really that good? What would you say it's a deal breaker for you? Underestimating your audience. There are episodes, there have been some moments where I thought, okay, the the writers, for whatever reason, didn't think the audience would notice something or that they wouldn't put two and two together. Uh, Mayor Duell often comes up in this. Uh, oh, God, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Because not only did they have a, a moral that I thought was very skewed, they also had to spell it out and not, let, not trust the audience to listen. Today's episode, Mod Pie. Oh, oh, don't say anything. I haven't watched it yet. Oh, okay. I, I won't spoil anything, except that it relates to a family member. And I think reading the summaries, it kind of made me think of the introduction of Cadence and Shining Armor, which was not necessarily a deal breaker, but I was frustrated that they said, oh, this character's always been there. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, no, I've been watching this show, and I know that little kids remember past episodes you're introducing this character way, way too sloppily. It's when I feel like the writers are just have a moment where they think, oh, the, our audience is young. They're not going to notice. No. Kids notice. They may not be able to articulate, but they notice. So basically, do not patronize the audience. Yes, very much. Just like Pinky Pride. Great episode. Didn't even spell out the moral beyond Pinky's real- realization. It trusted its audience. I think they didn't even tell us what the moral is. You have to buy that in the journal that's going to come out really soon. <laughs> oh, Lord. Yeah, that's pretty much how they are selling that one merchandise piece. That makes sense. I, uh, I, well, I did buy the Welcome to Equestria book, so why not? I did buy the Elements of Harmony book as well, so... <laughs> Same here. You know what? They, <laughs> they got my money. And the best thing is Amy Keating Rogers is writing that book, so Yay! <laughs> You know, I want to buy that one book most because it's it's written by a writer that I really respect and admire all the way back from Power, Powerpuff Girls mm-hmm. rather than uh, it's, oh, it's a piece of pony merchandise. <laughs> I so want this. Mm. There are so many things of merchandise that I haven't bought. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've avoided it. I'm a collector by habit, but uh, I've kept my pony collection pretty small. So, um, Silver, I was wondering, when you, you review an episode, do you take the writer into mind or do you just review the episode as it is? I will admit that if it's Meriwether Williams, who for a long time I consider to be the least fitting writer for this series, I'm aware of it. By and large, it doesn't factor. And thankfully, Williams' most recent episodes have been much stronger. I think she's really finding her stride. That's not to say there aren't character or sort of quirks in writing that I'm starting to notice. But by and large, I just sort of focus on the episode and try not to make a big deal out of the writer. That's good, because you can end up getting biased towards or against uh, a writer. And th- that kind of became a theme in season one and also in season two. Uh, because when Dave Polsky wrote Over a Barrel, people kind of like became wary of any other episode that he may touched. And he's like, oh, careful, Dave Polsky is writing a new episode. He wrote over a barrel. It's going to be a complete disaster. Uh, the same way with Williams when she wrote uh, Murder Well. And people were just wary or whatever she may come up with next. Or oh, Amy Larson. <laughs> well, they just made a meme out of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and with writers like M.A. Larson or, or, hell, even Amy Keating Rogers, is the opposite case. It's like, oh, uh, Amy wrote this episode. It's going to be instantly brilliant. Or M.A. Larson wrote this episode. Everyone is going to have wings at the end of it. No, just kidding. Uh, mm. But no, it's like it, that, that works both ways. That kind of like being biased towards an episode because of who wrote it. You have to take care of those kind of situations because, well, we may have our favorites, but sometimes high anticipation or low expectation can really take us for a turn. Silver, I was wondering, how do you set up your jokes 
I, I see a recurring gag with certain elements from your reviews, like Slender Pony or even with King Sombra, and now the big giant worm. Well, what did they call that worm? I don't remember. The Treasure Moth? No, uh, the uh, Tassel Worm. Tassel Worm. Mm-hmm. Will you continue that on? And what's your inspiration for this kind of gag? Well, part of it is just to sort of make a joke at the situation. Because I don't want to take this too seriously. It's for fun. All of this, the show, the reviews, the comics, all for fun. And so part of it is to avoid not getting uh, fixated on one thing and blowing it out of proportion. But part of it is just I've enjoyed a lot of media and jokes over time. And so I can kind of draw on that memory uh, to put a twist on things. And also just to look at a scene and think, okay, how can I make this as bizarre as possible? Case in point, Twilight Time, uh, the little foal who has an orange coat and dark blue mane. I looked at that kid and I thought, wait, that's Flash Century's color scheme. That's kind of weird. <laughs> and it's like, what, is he supposed to be a relative? Oh, God, what if he were his kid? Would all the flashlight people get really mad if that happened? Oh, God. <laughs> Twilight then, does have a baby. <laughs> and so I took it a step further. It's like, okay, what if I ask Flash about this? <laughs> he can't get mad. I'd just be asking a question. I could do Fox News. <laughs> <laughs> and that's sort of the process down the rabbit hole. Just keep asking myself questions and in turn... See what the answers crop up. Because I, I I laugh at that joke seriously because, hmm, this is interesting. What? You did this? Like, during your review, you take a left turn and made a joke and got back on track. You know what? I, I see the resemblance to your review style with the critic and his new style now, where he reviews, 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 make a whole joke, and then continue on with the review. Really good. To use the critic as an example, uh, you guys ever heard of a reviewer named The Distressed Watcher? He um, used to be on that kind yeah. of classes. Oh. Yeah, his, his name is the Amazing Atheist. atheist. Mm-hmm. It's and the same for, guy, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and both he and the critic reviewed Dungeons & Dragons, the movie. And the distressed watcher, Amazing Atheist, he did a good review. He pointed out all the flaws. But when the critic did it, he started off not by reviewing the history of the movie, by saying, we are in for a treat. Brace yourselves. You could tell right away he was going to have fun with this. Yes. And that made his review so much more appealing. Yeah, because one is more factual and it has, it's more exact in its, in its facts, but the other is more entertaining. So that's where you draw the line is that should I make a review that is factual and exact but very boring or make one that is not entirely factual but really fun and entertaining? And also aim for hopefully a meeting between the two. Uh, I still hope to get, share my thoughts, but with some humor thrown in just to say, hey, even if you don't agree, hopefully you're getting a good laugh out of this. That's that's my point. That's me. That's me right there. Like I said, I think the first time I agreed with you in a review was with Simple Ways. By the way, I think you are one of the three or four people on the internet who gave that episode a somewhat positive review. <laughs> But I was like, oh my god, that's that's the first time I agreed with him. But you know what? I didn't mind not agreeing with you in other uh, reviews because they are so much fun. They're so good. And I tell you, when I am working, they're one of my videos, uh, one of my preferred videos to boot. I put them on my other computer and just play them like I'm, uh, while I'm working. That's fine. That's what I do when, I, uh, when I'm working on my vectors. I need a little sound going in the background. Yeah. Talk you up any number of reviews or videos. Let's Plays or a, a movie or just a, an episode of a TV show or whatever, yeah. So, uh, in Twilight Time, you did a mini review of... What was it again? I forgot that episode. Oh, dang it. A mini review. Uh, well, there was the Crusaders and how they their journey up until now. Yeah, like in that the scene where you were talking with yourself, you did an old style review without just black like backgrounds and stuff. Because I was wondering, hmm, did he did this review before? I, I haven't seen this before. Where was this? Oh, that that was my very first video, uh, the the get hyped the princess debate. You talk about bias. I have been watching episodes this season to say, okay, they pitched this princess Twilight thing as we. I had fans arguing for nine months over this <laughs> thing. Give me something here, guys. Come on. Make me feel, help me feel like this was worth it. And unfortunately, that's a criticism I have of this fourth season. It's been fun. I've had a lot of great times watching these episodes, but 
Princess Twilight is still kind of a non-factor. Here's the thing that I noticed. People were complaining that, no, we don't want Twilight to change. Rah, 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 rah. And now that Twilight is kind of the same. They say, no, oh, we want Twilight to change. Rah, 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 rah. Well, it's not so much that. I think that what people want is an... They want the show to do something with Twilight. They haven't done anything with her yet. It's looking for that balancing point. Just as I go for comedy and hopefully insight, I don't want Twilight to change either. You know, I, I enjoy her personality, and I do see a lot of myself in that. What I would like to see is that the character of Twilight Sparkle learning to adjust to being royalty, not just a celebrity, but a leader, mm. more so than she's been in the past. So it's not fearing that Twilight will change and only be interested in pretty dresses and all that stuff, but that she acknowledges the responsibility and that her life has indeed changed. Mm. And mm. she'll not change but grow, which actually doesn't involve change, but in a natural way. So that that's the hard balancing point that people are going for. And that debate is also what inspired me to do videos in the first place. For nine months, I really look at forums and Derpy Boru and just the anger that seemed to be going everywhere. And both sides were making good points, but no one seemed to be able to just lay it all out without getting into a fight. And I think that's a weakness of forums. You, you're losing a lot of social cues. With the video, you can hear my voice, you can hear me joking. Uh, hopefully I sound a little less hostile than I might if I was just posting text on a forum. <laughs> and I think that can, um, I think that can really help open people up to a different perspective, and without the hostility. Well, I can tell you one thing right now is that what you what you have going for you that it, you don't sound hostile at all is because you have a very soft, very level-headed tone of saying things. It's like you are not screaming, you are not shouting, you don't sound angry, you sound really calm. And uh, you sound very gentle at the same time. I'm pretty sure that when you're typing something, because you don't have the people, the person's voice uh, speaking to you directly, I'm pretty sure that what you're saying, it might sound a lot more hostile when you're typing it. But believe it, right now, your hostility is zero. Well, I could try to talk deeper. Ah, we have the Batman. <laughs> Yay! I think we kind of missed out on this question, but how long does it take for you to make a video from start to finish? Because I only see here, like, okay, there's 10 minutes worth of video, but how long does it really take? The general rule is that for every minute of video you see is an hour of at least editing and then putting together different poses and graphics that can take upwards of several hours per character. So really, there's at least 24 hours that can go into a video. And, you know, it's not like I, I do it all in one day. I'm working on the graphics throughout the week, and that's usually where a bulk of the time lies. I've learned, with trial and error, I've learned to lay out the video much faster. Like, one of your videos, like Twilight Time, it's out for six days ago, and, like, maybe some fans were wondering, like, Ah, oh, where's the next video? It's already in Pinky, the new Pinky show. Where's the next video? Yeah. In that oh. tone, yes. Uh, <laughs> actually, one, person, one person commented, It's been about six days. I hope nothing's happened to her. <laughs> they, they kind of assume that I'm in gross bodily harm. <laughs> well, that's good to know that you have such devoted fans. <laughs> There goes. I appreciate their concern, but I, I'll never be a same-day reviewer. Odds are there'll always be a week gap, at least, between my review and the episode. But uh, and I am I am a little self-conscious about it. You know, I'm like, oh, I really need to get this done. <laughs> but like, there's a lot of life to live as well outside of the review community. Mm, so true. it's a balancing act always. That and also I. I put a lot of time into my comics as well, so there's sort of div divided fan tendencies there. One thing that I was forgetting to ask, then I remember that I forgot, I remembered again. Uh, when you're posting videos on YouTube, one of the things that seems to be a, a, a sadly an, a, a running theme with the, the Brownie Analyst community is that they always get hit with YouTube's totalitarian content ID system. And so far from what I from what I've seen here, on, at least on YouTube, you don't seem to be having that 
problem or if you're having it, you, you know how to take it under control and keep it down. Uh, uh, how do you, how, how have you handled that or if you ever have to face it? Well, actually, I owe a lot of that to the analysis community. Um, one of the reviewers, Golden Fox, he has a um, dialogue right now to help people when, if they need to challenge a copyright claim. So very professional, very articulate. And he freely shares this with people to help them out. I have gotten uh, notices that YouTube has said you're using third-party content. In other words, you didn't make this. And the answer is, well, yeah, I'm doing a review. And I'm using footage from the show as part of this review. That's where the wrinkle lies. I worked in a legal job for several years and actually studied up on copyright law. So part of me understands that, one, YouTube is doing this not because they hate everyone and everything, but because someone else is going to sue them if they think their copyright mm-hmm. is being infringed. And so unfortunately, there's always a the phrase, there's always a bigger fish, always a greater evil. I don't think they're doing this the right way, but at the same time, there's no way you could hire a staff to monitor every video. Well, so unfortunately, we've got, we've got this automated abomination instead. If you click on some of my videos, you may get a commercial uh, before it starts. That is not me. I did not monetize any of my videos. Mm. That all The money from that ad is going to Hasbro as sort of compensation for their content. Do you mind things happening that way? Because, well, like we always say, support Hasbro by buying their swag. But in this case, what's your video to support Hasbro? Uh, do you mind it that way? I don't necessarily mind. I understand the concept that you have to assert yourself in protecting your intellectual property. Otherwise, it becomes generic and you lose any hold on it. A very funny example is, you guys have heard of Xerox, the copy maker. Yep, yep, I heard of it. People would you say, oh, I've got to go Xerox this document. If you use something as a verb, it becomes generic and you can't have a copyright on that. Similar term, if My Little Pony videos were just popping up everywhere and they never asserted any sort of, you can't, we own this, you can't just simply take it then they'd lose any right to it, and then the show would go away because they've lost their intellectual property. Mm. So it's, again, balancing act. It's not fun. I wish it weren't a factor, but I understand the need to assert it. I don't mind that YouTube is saying you have third-party content because, one, people can still watch it. Nothing's been taken down, knock on wood. And I'm not opposed to... If part of this give-and-take with fandom is they get to put an ad before my review... I'm not going to get worked up about that. And I have also thought about, okay, if one day their policy changes and they just crack down on using any video, my reviews will not die. They will change. I will just have to find a different format because they can challenge me on using video footage in a little pop-up window to illustrate a point. But if I draw all the images myself, that is my generated content. I haven't taken anything from them aside from the image of their characters. Which they will contest, surely. They'll contest, but I'm also prepared to just say, I'm using this under fair use. That's a defense. And you just got to go in for the slog. And also watching Angry Joe's uh, process, I know a little bit what to expect. Oh, poor guy. He got hit really hard. And like half of his videos are still flagged. As, as inappropriate. It's kind of getting lesser because of certain companies saying, oh, that's not us. That's the, that's the YouTubes. You, YouTube, stop doing that. Yeah, there, there are a couple of cool companies. Like Bethesda is really, uh, it, they don't mind people doing Let's Plays or, or reviews of their videos. They are very okay with that. But yes, it is YouTube doing that because they don't have control over their ID system. Because it's it's a robot. It's a it literally is a robot that selects what gets banned and what get, doesn't get banned. And nobody has control over that. There is, there is literally no way to contact in YouTube and saying, hey, can you please get my video back? Because according to what Angry Joe said, there is no customer service. No, you got to go through the appeal system, which can be kind of a real dice roll. It's an absolute pain to go through. And for people that actually make a living uh, like that, it is really hard. It's like a war of attrition. Let's see who gives up first. And usually, here's the the sad part, is that is the content creator ends up giving up because they don't have time to deal with this kind of, uh, kind of crap. But I'm hopeful that things will iron out, that at the very least YouTube might at least refine their automated monster at some point. 
that's everyone's hope really that's everyone's hope including mine because uh, it's no fun when you're um how do i put this the way my show works or our show works is at the end of each episode i feature a song by the community and once i tried to feature the beetle bronies and it got flagged by the beetles <laughs> yeah the beetle Yep. Yeah, apparently, yeah, because they were using similar tone, apparently mm. uh, they flagged it as a Beatles song when it was uh, something done by the Beatles Bronies. Yep. So, yeah, my policy is, nope, I don't want to deal with this, take down video, change the ending, do something else, done. It's, yeah, you gotta pick your fights. It is a battle. Something tells me that... Sooner or later, like if YouTube doesn't fix this, somebody else is going to come up with a with a video website, and they're going to try to find partnerships or whatever to cover themselves, so anyone can upload whatever kind of video they want without having to deal with this kind of content ID system. It's kind of like a utopic view, I know, but people keep going to YouTube just because they have a really good video player. They don't go because they want to use Google+, Plus. they don't want because they want to face the content ID system or because they want to have the interface change every three weeks. <laughs> they, they go because the video player is somewhat better than the other video players. And after seeing other websites like Dailymotion and Blip TV, which is the one that that guy with the glasses use, Personally, I don't think it's YouTube is going to end up becoming obsolete sooner or later. We don't know. We don't know. And I don't dare question. So, Silver, uh, I was wondering, your videos usually are 10 minutes long. How do you keep your reviews short? When I first started out, I had much longer scripts. And on um, the edit of my first video, I, I said, you know what? This is good, taking forever. What can I take out of this thing? I kind of shot myself in the foot because when you've recorded it, it's kind of hard to edit out stuff because you can't go back and change your dialogue easily. You can re-record it, but that's even more time. Generally, as a rule, when it's just me, I keep it to about eight pages of script. And uh, I have my own little format where it's two columns, graphic descriptions on the left, text on the uh, what I'm going to say on the right. And so I try to keep it within that page limit. And this is also helps with not getting bogged down on one point. No more than two or three sentences per topic. If I really need to go into depth, even then, you know, a sentence can carry a lot of weight. And it's a very poor mistake to think that being verbose is the same as being insightful or funny. So basically keep it to the two to three rule limit, two to three sentence limit, and the eight pages Unless, you know, there's a lot of setup involved in a joke, like, well, like my Twilight Time opening. Uh, that was awesome. That was Talking awesome. with myself. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, I could, I could totally imagine you having that argument with yourself in your mind. <laughs> that, was really, that was really well done. Oh, yes. I argue with myself all the time, just trying to make sense and process the events. You know what? I think everybody does. I, I think every healthy person does take a moment to have an argument with themselves. To, to figure out how to solve things or how to face a situation. In the end, it's very healthy. <laughs> uh, it depends. And honestly speaking, I, I do like your format, your way of doing things. Because me and James here, we do a weekly episode of the episode review in podcast form where we discuss things we like, almost like this. And mm -hmm. my goodness, can we run really long? <laughs> oh, it's easy to get swept up in it. It's, it's fun. Yes, indeedy. Yeah, it's a little yeah. mental aerobics. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It is fun. However, we do break the the one rule that you said about no no more than three sentences per topic. It's like we can go over <laughs> one thing for like over and over and over. like. Do you remember that um, in that Monty Python uh, sketch when they are talking about the speed of an African swallow uh, carrying a coconut, that, and they are trying to change topic and they keep going, look. If the if the swallow is holding the coconut with a string, maybe he'll be able to carry it. It's like, yeah. Sometimes our conversations go that way, and it's not precisely like it. It can be fun, but it becomes pathetically funny mm -hmm. at True. one point. Uh, for example, our recent episode. Um, look, uh, no, uh, someone to watch over. Some pony to watch over me or you. What something like that? That whole setup where we talk, everything was focused on the fire pit. Fire pit or... And the fire swamps yeah, fire action swamp. scene. Yeah, yeah we spent a lot of time talking there, about like, that. Yeah, 80% there. Like, 
wow, we should love this scene, don't we? Rodents of unusual size? I don't believe they exist. <laughs> <laughs> love it. That's the the best uh, Princess Bride shout out that this this cartoon could give. Indeed. Now we just need uh, an episode where Applejack goes to the one who killed her father and go like, "Hello, my name is Applejack of the Apple Clan. <laughs> you killed my father. <laughs> Prepare to die." Uh, yeah, it is a good movie. You should. It is guys, a very good movie. Yeah, you should go watch it. Go watch it. <laughs> so besides the videos, you also do art and comics, right? I do. Which is really rare. Oh, no, I won't say rare. People. Uh, if they don't really know, might miss out on this. And you do have a deviant art page. You do do comics, and you do really good comics and really long comics. Yeah, my, <laughs> I, the current one I'm working on a multi-parter. I started it just after the end of season three, and I'm about four pages away from completion now. Yay! Or five, five pages. I use one, two, three kinds of comics now. <laughs> But, yeah, this is really how I first got involved with the Brony community and uh, started making comics. And I've been lucky in that Equestria Daily has featured uh, some of them on their on their blog, which it's amazing. If you get featured on Equestria Daily, you can literally hit the refresh button and see your activity numbers going up by 50, 100 every second. Would you say it's over 9,000? <laughs> yeah, it's over 9,000! <laughs> It is a bit intimidating to see that happen, isn't it? Because you are like, oh my God, people are checking this out. Oh, all of these people, where are they coming from? Then you have the, those moments where you are like, where is the desk so I can hide underneath it? It's kind of like, oh. It, it is even take, I get giddy when I see those numbers uh, shooting up, just stunned, and, I, and it's wonderful. There is the desire not to disappoint people with either my comics or my videos, so that's part of why I get self-conscious about being too late and getting a review out. Mm. But by and large, I, I still remember the first time I got featured and just the, the amazement. I got up just before work, I posted a comic, and I thought, yeah, let's just see if anyone commented overnight. <laughs> I, I just started this account. It was um, I had maybe 100 on the activity level, and it shot up to 1,000. Linked it, I was like, did I log into the right account? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was stunning. But, I, you know, I think I also want to mention the first comic that I ever submitted to Equestria Daily did not make it. It was not up to snuff. And when I saw comics that had made the cut, I was like, yeah, they did a better job. So I went back, looked at what I'd done, and scrapped it I, and started over. And then, yeah, I actually did get featured, which was a wonderful feeling. So, you know, it's not instant success. Sometimes it's taking a hard look at what you didn't do right and saying, okay, I'm not giving up. Mm -hmm. And the best thing about that is you learn something because uh, I, I forgot who said this, but um, by failure, you learn how you learn a little bit of success. Or is it the quote wrong? I, I don't remember, but something like that. <laughs> The, the, the definite philosophy is there. Yeah. Yeah, it's like like Jake the Dog said in Adventure Time, sucking at something is the first step at being good at something. Yeah. And that applies for pretty much everything, from uh, 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 start drawing something to being featured in a, in a website to uh, dealing with people or like uh, building relationships with them. It's, it, it's always there. You need to start being bad at something to end up becoming good at it. And with my current comic, this one that's been going on for so long, it will likely never be featured on Equestria Daily because it features an original character. Oh, yep, yep. Ooh. I think I've seen this comic on EQD before, but I'm not 100% sure. I shouldn't have. Yeah, you I, know. I, I, I never submitted it. And I, I try to respect, I understand why Equestria Daily can't feature original characters for the most part. You know, there's little exceptions, but they'd probably be flooded with submissions of people sending every... OC piece that is out there in the fandom. Oh yeah, they they definitely do it for they do it for uh, filtering purposes. They don't do it because they don't like OCs. But I've been very proud that people have taken a liking to my character. Which I know people have. There's a stigma about original characters. You know, the overpowered Alicorn uh, who can do everything better than the main cast. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So that is that is a big stigma. It is, which is why I went with a clumsy Earth Pony who. Uh, just seems to be the most accident-prone being in existence. 
But you, you know, on the call here, we have James, and his OC is one of the strangest OC I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't want to bring it up. Uh, and this is kind of also regarding a question daily, the the rule about OCs. They do feature an OC from time to time, and even in my case, they uh, they did put a couple of my pictures with my OC on the draw friend, which I completely didn't expect. Uh, but yeah, I mean, my OC has it's a it's a unicorn mare with uh, uh, with celluloid mane and tail, and she reviews movies. By the way, that character doesn't represent me at all. It's just one OC. I don't have one that represents me. But it is it it's the type of character that you look at it and you say, I don't want to draw that. I don't want to draw that. It's so difficult. And however, I get a bunch of fan art. I have like a, an entire folder of it, and I don't understand it. Yeah, the, this fandom does have kind of like a, a hatred towards overpowered alicornosis, but other type of OCs, they seem to they seem to like them very very much. Mm. And I can totally see the appeal on yours because uh, Clatterstep, that I think he's he's is that that's his name, right? Clatterstep. You you got it. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Not only does he look really adorable, but he looks uh, he looks uh, like a, the type of character that blends in the background, <laughs> which is it's basically the best kind of way you can de- describe an OC. Is like a good OC is the type of OC that can be passed for a background pony. Then he has the, the marking around his uh, left eye, which is very uh, very distinctive. But everything else, background pony. And I am like, that's a very good design. I can totally see why people took uh, took a liking of him. And, and yeah, I owe a lot to uh, the fandom for him looking like that. When I first started drawing, I'm not big on pastels. I like really bright and vivid colors. So the uh, clutter step was very saturated blue, like, you know, com- stand him against the, uh, the show and he's glowing like a neon sign. <laughs> and his mane was much more anime style. And there were some people who who offered very fair and very well put criticism, and I did a redesign based on that. It's done much better because of it. Again, just like with some into Equestria Daily, you know, instant success isn't necessarily realistic. You just keep trying and figure out what works. Mm, oh, okay. So, obvious question here now: um, What program do you use to draw? <laughs> The pony vectors come through Illustrator, and then I put up the word bubbles and get it ready for the web through Photoshop. Ah, okay. Totally different from mine. Uh, the way I use it is just everything from Illustrator, even the text bubbles. And I've, been, I've been thinking about doing that uh, because then I can you know, move the text bubbles in with the characters. But right now, I've just been sort of playing it pretty straightforward. Basically, I'm, just, I'm sort of looking ahead that I want to keep doing the comics and try to make them a little more diversified than just six panels mm. lined up. I see you're trying to evolve from that in your latest comic, uh, Princess Tale, uh, uh, Princesses, Princesses, uh, Princess Tears, Part 29. It's a bit different from the your standard formats. I'd like to sh- sh- shake things up a little. I'm looking at this one comic, uh, A Tale from NDK 2012, and not only you have pony characters here, but you also have like a Solid Snake, Wolverine, Sailor Moon, Gundam, and I'm like, all of this, all of this, you have the creepers from Minecraft, so, uh, all of these characters, I guess you didn't draw them in, in Illustrator, right? That was my older style. I would draw the line art in Illustrator, but then I'd color them in in Photoshop. Uh huh. I've learned a lot of more about Illustrator since then, so uh, I might actually be able to draw that in Illustrator entirely, which would be uh, much better in terms of posing the comic. This one was uploaded in 2012. I have to say, it looks really good. It is very eclectic. I kind of like this combination. It's so weird to see uh, Wolverine with Lyra in one picture at the same time as you see Vinyl doing the Gangnam style with uh, Gundam. (laughs) It's a very tiny Gundam. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very tiny Gundam. Uh, it is. This is amazing. I'm looking at it right now, and it's really amazing. Uh, and based based on a true story, which is always fun. That was <laughs> that was a good convention. Oh, I, now I really need to uh, pay attention to it. <laughs> so, uh, okay, yeah, I have. I do have one question from a from a completely artistic point of view. What is your favorite character to draw and your least favorite character to draw? Let's see. 
The ponies all go by similar body types, so I can't say one is a lot harder to draw than the other. I think any of the main six are really fun to draw, especially in the facial expressions. Celestia is the hardest character to draw, even more hard, even more difficult than Discord. Oh, wow! Because, How come? Mean. Well, well, the main uh, like my enemy mind comic Discord is all kinds of different body parts, but they break up. They're each sort of sectioned off with very clear dividing line. So it's kind of easy to know where they fit. Celestia, her mane sort of comes over her forehead, and there's no dividing line. I have to, like, mask out parts of her. And then there's the crown and the jewelry uh, oh. all around her. So when I'm posing her, I can't just, uh, you know, go by one model. I've got to rework the, the her fashion as well. So she is by far the hardest character to draw. Oh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I, I know exactly what you're talking about right there. Oh, God. And I also have a, a small library of Celestia mains, so I can actually make it look like it's rippling. Exactly, because you have to like give them that sense of movement. I'm also frustrated because I would love to actually feature Celestia in a comic at some point, but I don't know how they animate her mane like that. I have no idea. And so <laughs> I... I don't know. I'd probably have to call on a brony animator to help me out there. <laughs> I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. So can we expect Silver Quill the Hippogriff in the comic soon? Um, clutter, the comics are mostly Clutter's domain, but uh, I wouldn't mind if at some point, maybe if I'm recounting uh, events at BabsCon, which I'm going to next month. Ah. You know, I use Clutter as a stand-in for the Tale from NDK years ago, but now I have my own OC. Mm, okay. I'll tell you that they're both my OC, but, you know, one is me, one is definitely not me. Mm, one is your avatar. Exactly. Hmm. Talking about conventions, um, you're going to BabsCon this year? Yes, first BronyCon, uh, well, not BronyCon, but Brony convention uh, I've ever been to. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, so it will be, it will be an experience, and I'm lucky enough to host a panel. Oh, cool. What's the panel about? After the fact analysis. Analysts. I will work on the pronunciation before the panel. But uh, I'm just going to go over my own experience in reviews and also try to offer some tips on finding your own style and the technology involved. Ah. Funny enough, James, you are going to a convention too, right? Yeah, well, yeah, I'm going to go to a convention, but that's a, th- that's a subject for another time. <laughs> How do we segue to that? I'm, I'm giving you a good segue. Take it, man. No, I'm not going to because Silverquill is the protagonist of this of this episode. <laughs> and you're the antagonist. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, how how are you planning the that panel in particular? Like, uh, what is it going to be? It's like fifty fifty? One about uh, one part about art, the other about uh, reviewing and analysis, or are you kind of like going to combine them together? I'm going to divide it up into three parts. Basically, the first the all-important question of why review, much as we've been talking about uh, here, you know, the different perspectives, expression, and all importance, it's why are you reviewing a kid's show question. Then talking about why I like humor, but you don't have to be a comedian to really do this. I, I do really appreciate hearing the thoughts from other analysts like Tommy Oliver, Digi Brony, A&Y, Golden Fox, Ink Rose, I could go on. Sometimes, and it's not always episode reviews, sometimes maybe you just want to review the music. Mm-hmm. It's all about making an identity to your reviews. And then it's the question of what editing software, if you're using a, a character avatar, what? how do you save the files? A lot of people use PNG. I prefer TIFF. Good format, that, good format. Very good. And, you know, I could get into all the technical aspects, but... Uh, I could totally get into a conversation about the technical aspects with you. I have I studied that. <laughs> we can nerd out. We can nerd out once the once the podcast is over. <laughs> Format connoisseurs. <laughs> well, I prefer PNG. You see, because the quality of the picture doesn't get lost, like with the JPEG. Which, oh my God, JPEG is so two thousand and one. But moving on. <laughs> Is if people will take anything from my panels, it's that don't use JPEG. But JPEG saves files. <laughs> JPEG is the, 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 the quality killing format. You're going to kill your picture if you use JPEG. Uh, 
If you if you want to send me fan art, JPEG is great, but uh, don't make a review around JPEG. <laughs> oh, that is true, man. Oh, that is true. But anyway, yes, I'm I'm going to take this into techno land. Yay! But still, but still, um, I I do hope the panel's recorded so I can at least listen to it because you know, being here in Asia, no, won't get a chance. I need to follow up on that. I do not have one thing. I don't have is a video camera, which I wouldn't mind setting it up and at least recording it. If I'm not mistaken, um, well, I'm not 100% sure if your panel is going to be recorded or not, but um, I hope it does. And, well, you don't need to do anything, and it will be uploaded on YouTube for free. (laughs) (laughs) You're so open. Yep, yep. Silver, is there anything you want us to talk about, to promote anything? Well, I could say uh, Babscon is coming up, and apparently they've got the entire voice acting cast for the main six there, which they're a strong company, so I'm looking forward to at least being in the same building (laughs) so I can actually get into the panel with them. (laughs) Yay. Same building. That's awesome. And we we may have to mention that it is the first Brony convention that she goes to after the uh, horrible debacle that was Las Vegas' (sighs) Unicorn. Uh, No, we, we do not talk about that convention now. Just now. Although that is a, uh, I think that is a testament to the Brony community that after hearing how poorly things went, people uh, chipped in to compensate the the, the guests. Mm, indeed, indeed. So, you know, something bad happened, but one of the best testaments of fan community is taking something negative and turning it into a positive. Yeah, thankfully the, the, there was a, a lot of good that came out of it. The situation was under control, and we managed to uh, we managed to keep Hasbro, the Hasbro gods appeased, uh, because we were this close to absolutely and completely uh, uh, lose the opportunity to have more uh, newcomers in this in this uh, type of convention. Well, technically, James Hasbro always said no, but the agents say yes, and we were pleasing the agents really. <laughs> Well, well, that's we, true. Working with someone uh, connected to the show, and that is one other thing with both my comics and my videos. Um, a lot of this is born out of there's a situation where I might find it frustrating. Uh, my aside from the Princess Tears comic, the comics that feature more of the main cast, usually I'm making fun of something in an episode that is like that felt weird. So that's just sort of finding a way to put a funny spin on something that might have pushed me in a, in a weird way. And like I say, I started my first video because I really just wanted to lay out this whole Princess Twilight argument, try to get both sides, give them a say, and just get it out there without a flame war. And sometimes that's that's the best, I think that's the healthy way to go. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, they say that uh, they say that two people don't argue if one of them doesn't want to. So you do have to be like the grown-up there and try like not continue the flame war and just step away from it respectfully and, and, and calmly. Mm-hmm. Because if, if, if you don't, you might, the situation might, not, might end up angry. Mm-hmm. Oh, here's a random question. Silver, for Princess Twilight or against Princess Twilight? <laughs> Despite hesitations, I am for it. I think, I think she's earned it. I think uh, she is probably the, one of the best characters to take on this role. It's not a question of uh, is she qualified, but it's just getting to see her learn the role, mm. which is, a, like I say, I'd really love to see an episode or two give her that opportunity. Let the character Twilight shine through in a new role. Yeah. Oh, okay. so that's, and that's what I keep my eyes open for. Understandable. Yeah, you know, that's a good way to say it. Uh, I, I do so like I, her I, new... I, I, Sorry, James? No, it's like, yeah, like, you were going to say you like it, I like it as well. Mm-hmm. Um Mostly because I like to see a character grow and change. Because it's like, come on, you're going to throw this char- you're throwing this character a lot. You're making them suffer greatly. Mm-hmm. At least give them a reward at the end. <laughs> uh, true. Make indeed. make make the make the journey worth it. Like uh, all the things that Twilight had to go through in season two, and all the things that she had to go through in season three. Um, at least give her something that makes all of this suffering or all of this pain worth her time and, and worth the time of the viewer and the, the investment of the viewer mm-hmm. oh well and with that I think we got no more questions and well thank you Silver for answering our totally random questions and well 
just basically th- thank you for answering our questions. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Oh, thank you so much for coming here, and uh, we hope we didn't, we didn't like scare you off, <laughs> or or uh, yeah, or like harass you too much with our with our questioning. I have been to otaku conventions. <laughs> Nothing scares me anymore. Uh, <laughs> the NBA show confirmed for being better than otaku conventions. <laughs> We're getting some. <laughs> so anyway, Silva, where can they find you online? Well, let's see here. Uh, on DeviantArt, I'm under MLP hyphen silver hyphen quill. So a lot of hyphens in there. And you can find me on YouTube. I was very happy to see that YouTube actually auto-completes the search for my name. Yay. That must mean something. I have set up a Patreon account, which you can find through my YouTube channel. And I'm also on finfiction.net, again, under the name MLP silver quill. You write fan fiction too? I do. I've only got one up right now, and one is half complete. I want to finish this current comic first. Okay, well, I shall be reading your work then. <laughs> Excellent. No to the Facebooks? I'll be honest, I'm, I'm kind of new to social media. I can have you all beat the old man contest. <laughs> your kids today with your iPads and your eyeballs. <laughs> can I, I, I can tell you one thing. Right now, do not use Facebook. <laughs> Don't, don't. Like three, three weeks after using Facebook, you're going to be just throwing, it, flipping a table, screaming, "I am the most miserable human being alive!" Because Facebook, it is, it is proof that Facebook makes you a lot sadder and a lot more depressed. Hey James, I, I use this Facebook. I'm not that sad. Well, you might be the exception that confirms the rule. <laughs> no, honestly though. Uh, Social media can be good. It can be it can be useful, but don't expect a lot of uh, positive feedback from it. Mm-hmm. The, the thing about social media is that it also open. It's like opening a can of worms, usually marinated with a lot of vitriol and hatred. So be careful with that. Well, yeah, I get the occasional downer in, on YouTube. Someone who just either doesn't like brownies or or just doesn't like review videos, which hey, it's not for everybody. Yeah, it is fair. I mean, if people hate it, hate it. But sometimes, you, don't you ever wonder, like, if you like, if you hate something, why? First of all, why do you watch it? And second, why do you have the need to voice out your your hatred for it in such a such a mean, nasty way? James, it's the internet. <laughs> it's the- yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. It is the internet. It's just that sometimes I don't understand people. Well, you know, there was an actual study that confirms that most Internet trolls are indeed sociopaths and uh, all around, you know, have a very strong stigma. Mm. And the Internet's really the only place they can express that because you can't, they can't get punched in the face. But I, I do often wonder, you know, you wouldn't go into a sports bar and scream, I hate football. <laughs> you, would, you wouldn't go into yeah. an ice cream shop and say, I don't like sweets. Yeah. Same premise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you you don't go into an M. Night Shyamalan movie and say, I like <laughs> cinema. <laughs> uh, okay. We're in with that. Let's move on to the next topic. Thank you, <laughs> Silver, for answering our questions. <laughs> you bet. Thank you, guys. So in the next topic, it's letter time. We get letters. Wow, th- this is cool. And in today's letter time... Hi, Norman Sanzo. I just finished listening to MBS show episode number 102. I must say, you did an amazing job keeping the place, uh, keeping the peace among Daniel and James. Well done, indeed. <laughs> After the show ended, it was no wonder that you titled it When the Gloves Comes Off. Uh, touchy, indeed. I very much enjoy listening to the NBA show every week. Would it be too much if I ask for a shout out just once? Have a great week, Jen. And you know what, Jen? I'm sorry for not noticing your email because you kind of send it to one of the place that you know what? It's not your fault. It's my fault. And uh, Norman Sanzo Senpai has noticed you. <laughs> and you know what, Jen? Jen, thank you for the email. And please keep them coming. It's really fun. We don't usually get that angry anymore between Dan and I. We have buried the hatchet. When you mean buried, do you mean buried him? <laughs> uh, yeah, I buried him with the hatchet in his... No, no, no. We are cool now. <laughs> hey, that's awesome. <laughs> well, but, but anyway, moving on to the next topic is shoutouts. And my shoutout goes to you, Silver. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for being an amazing guest. And thank you for sharing your awesome stories. Glad to do it. I was glad to talk to fellow fans. Yay. 
And thank you, James, for helping me ask awesome questions. I do my best. And Jen, to you, you deserve a shout out. Yay! And what about you, James? Well, first of all, I wanted to give a shout out to Silverquill for uh, coming here and, and giving us such an insightful, fun interview that I think this is the longest interview that we have done so far. And I'm very sad because I want to keep it going, but we, we cannot stay here forever, sadly. Yeah. Sweetie Bot will kill you. Sweetie Bot will <laughs> kill you. Uh, but yeah, I want to I want to give him a, a big shout out for uh, for being so good, being so uh, so f- so much fun, so entertaining, and like I, I am going to repeat myself, but it's so insightful when it comes to not not just doing uh, your episode reviews, but uh, f- for coming here and so kindly answering our questions. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure, but I don't want you to die either. <laughs> my voice oh. killed a man. Oh God, no! <laughs> no, I don't. I don't want to die. I have. I want to draw you something. I, I, I can die after I've drawn you a picture, and then I, no. I will die happy. No, you can't, James. <laughs> you know you can't die because you need to go to Buck. Because why? Okay, I will go to Buck, and I will, and then I will die happy. No, uh, you, need, you have a panel. <laughs> don't avoid this, man. You, you, you tease people in the review episode. Now you need to tell people. I will tell people when it comes to uh, uh, to doing that episode, and we're gonna see to it next week. But ah. now, to finish the shoutouts, I want to give you a shoutout, Norman, for not firing me yet and putting <laughs> up with my attitude. Ah, no problem. Uh, no problem. Which I hope I to get under control this episode. I know I didn't swear. Yes, you did it. That's good. Yeah, I know I didn't swear. I, didn't, I think I didn't say a single swear word, so that's that's a good thing. And, uh, and I want to give a shout-out to all the people who were watching uh, my stream yesterday during during my birthday, uh, including awesome guys, awesome guys like Sketchy Sounds, uh, Animator Pika Pity, and my good friend Nick. And Silva, any shout-outs to give out to? Yes, I'd like to give a shout-out to the folks who comment on my comics and my videos, all the support I get, which is a huge uh, source of energy and enthusiasm. It keeps me going to make the next one. I also want to give a special shout-out to uh, DeviantArt user Runner Mark Wee 23 It's Runner MK Wee 23 He is putting together a fan dub of my Princess Tears comic. Oh, that's cool. Uh, He's been trying to gather a vocal cast for a very uh, long time. I don't think he quite realized how long I'd take to get the darn thing done. <laughs> so he's putting that together, and if you want to visit his DeviantArt page, he's looking for voice actors for the main six and some of the extra characters. So I'm hoping people will hit him up on that. Oh, cool. I like the voice act. <laughs> I cannot speak today. But anyway, I'll put that in the show notes. Excellent. And if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at mbsshow at gmail.com. Please do use that one because it's the most preferred method and I check that one every day. Uh, But if you want to email us personally, you can reach us. Well, links are in the show notes. And Twitter, that's something we use. Um, The show's Twitter account is at mbsshow. Sweetie Bot will tweet about raging on episode why this episode is so long. She will rage on that. And you can reach me at Norman Sanzo. I will usually tweet about pictures of food, toys, and kitty cats. Yay! And James, what about you? Ah, you can find me on Twitter at uh, James Lower Dash Cork uh, on Facebook. You can oh, on Facebook you cannot find me because I don't have one. <laughs> uh, you can find me on DeviantArt on uh, jamescork.deviantart.com, and you can check my Ask Pony Tumblr blog on askmovieslate.tumblr.com. Alrighty then. And also please subscribe and rate us on iTunes and also Stitcher Radio and like our Facebook page. Yes, it's a sad place, but we are making it happier. Yay! Anyway, I have been Norman Sanzo. I have been James Cork. And I have been Silver Quill, the man, the myth, the hippogriff. (laughs) That is an awesome way of ending. (laughs) And we'll see you guys next week with a budget for making our animation fly or something. (laughs) Bye, guys. Adios. Farewell. Bum bum ba ba da da dum bum bum ba ba da bum bum ba ba da da See the sunshine, some of the air today. Sky is clear, feeling so fine. Everything's gonna be okay. If you listen carefully, on every corner there's a rhythm playing. Then it happens suddenly, the music takes you over. When you find you got the music, you got the music in you. Find you got the music, you got.
the music in you. Oh, oh, oh. Every pony saying you should learn to express your voice. But if talk doesn't seem like it's the answer, luckily you have a choice. When you find you've got the music, you got the music in you. Find you've got the music, you got the music in you. Got the music, got the music in you. Hello, James. How are you? I'm fine. What is this that? <laughs> that definitely wasn't me. <laughs> uh, uh, three, two, one. Bruce Grayson here. Wow, his name is awesome. Like, seriously, Dick Grayson.